ओके वेलकम टू डी आर टी एस पी आर चैनल दिस इज डॉक्टर संख्या लो प्रसाद रेड्डी डॉक्टर टी एस पी आर नमस्ते आदाब हेलो वेलकम ऑल टू डी आर टी एस पी आर शो प्रोफेसर के पुरुषोत्तम रेड्डी गारु सर नमस्कार नमस्ते एंड ग्रीटिंग्स ऑन रिपब्लिक डे सेवेंटी फिफ्थ रिपब्लिक डे सेलेब्रेशन है ना डेबई ऐदव गणतंत्र दिनोत्सव जरूर भारतीय भारतीय पौर शुभ अभिवंदना सो ग्रीटिंग्स टू आल इंडियन सिटीजन अना लैट मी कम टू जे वंदन अन गए पद आगस्ट वस्तर स्वीट मिठाईल तिंटर पाटल पड़ता भक्ति पाटल पड़ता अब पातकाल मनोज कुमार भी सांग्स प्ले चेस्टर जे सल्यूटर हेल्लीत माला जनवरी इवे आर रागने मल इंको सू मल रागने अदे स्वीट मिठाईल जे वंदन सल्यूटर देशभक्ति गीता आ रोज नीचे रोज वरकू पातकाल मोहम्मद रफी मनोज कुमार आ पाटल इपड़की नाइना का दाने वनकाल आंतर्य सांतम की तेल उठदना खास्कर जनवरी इरव ईद पन्म याबई मन मदल पेटी गणतंत्र दिनोत्सव दी डे विच वी आर्लब्रेटिंग फ्रम नई फिफ्टी जनवरी ट्वेंटी सिक्स हाउ मेनी आफ अवर् इंडियन अंडर्स्टा दि डिफर बिटी The Independence Day, August fifteenth, and January twenty-sixth, nineteen fifty. Anna. So basically, Independence Day, I'll tell you, you know, as everybody knows, fifteenth August. That is the day when India became independent or free from the colonial rule. But uh, actually, the decision to prepare a constitution for a for an independent India. taking into consideration the rising aspirations of the teeming millions of people in this country that work started from 1946 to 49 and during that particular time the deliberations of the constituent assembly were excellent uh, world class debates took place because most of the constituent assembly members were actually freedom fighters they had uh, they come from throughout the country and from different parts and highly enlightened and having identified themselves with the people of this country their suffering so they could uh, think about the welfare of the people and uh, they accordingly produced a world class uh, document and uh, it became effective from 26th of january 1950 and uh, this particular document it has been amended about 106 times and uh, to because you know so many compelling reasons were there and uh, not going into the details of those amendments they were necessary and they only reflected the changing needs of society so here i wish to as you rightly pointed out we the people in this country happily celebrate independence day and republic day but in between now particularly in the new millennium 21st century we see a trend that we the people of india have become indifferent we are not vigilant as a result many things are going wrong which uh, i'll come to it towards the later part of the lecture i wish to on this very important occasion uh without uh, you know I, uh, without wasting any time i wish to focus on the wonderful struggle which was waged for the liberation of the country <clears throat> we have to view this freedom struggle as a people's revolt against the kind of colonialism that had uh, manifested particularly in, it just started in india but actually people from other colonies they were all looking towards india for leadership and guidance and they were hoping and praying that india would become free because that means uh, their freedoms also will follow and uh, that that is where indian freedom struggle becomes uh, very significant so just for the purpose of evaluating india's freedom struggle 
I, uh, because this is not the occasion to focus on that part of the lecture, I would like to just remind the audience the excellent work done by the early uh, saints and reformers uh, like Raja Ramon, Roy, Swami Vivekananda, Sri Aurobindo, uh, Swami Chaitanya, and so many others. You may call it Bhakti movement, Arya Samaj, Brahma Samaj. All these movements were necessary because India had, uh, we the people living in this country, had withdrawn into our shells, into a deep slumber. So to awaken the society, the, and uh, you know, uh, the, the, this was necessary because this is the language what, uh, what most people understood those days. So that was the first part. Then subsequently educated uh, uh, people of this country, they established what is known as the Indian National Congress. And again, please remember, this is not the Congress party of today. Yeah. Indian National Congress, those days, was nothing but the, uh, it, it symbolized uh, uh, India's freedom struggle. And they normally, we, the, we divide it into three parts. The first part is, uh, you know, in the beginning, it was extremely difficult even to sensitize the people in urban areas. So with a lot of difficulty, people in Bombay, Calcutta, and uh, Chennai, etc., some of these uh, urban, urban developed areas where mostly educated people, advocates were there, uh, they were able to slowly, you know, uh, using several techniques. For example, in Bombay and Maharashtra, it was Tilak uh, who took the lead. And uh, before Tilak, we have Dadabai Nauroji, Pirosha Mehta, and, uh, you know, people like them, Gopal Krishna Gokhale, Madhav Govind, Ranade. They are the people who started... Uh, highlighting the problems of the people of this country and particularly Gopal Krishna Gokhale through his wonderful letters to the British government he succeeded in highlighting the problems of the suffering people in Pune those days and uh, particularly when it became to when in the instance of cholera and plague uh, Gokhale's contribution is immense so that is similarly in, in Calcutta, we find uh, you know a lot of work sensitization being done by uh, say, Swami Vivekananda, and particularly here I wish to make a point when Swami Vivekananda went abroad and addressed a meeting at Chicago at the World Congress of Religions. And when the world stood up to uh, applaud us, give him a big applause, when uh, the paper, newspapers in America and elsewhere highlighted uh, his speech, it was then that India recognized the real importance of Swami Vivekananda. His speech can be described as having given an, uh, you know, an intravenous injection to the people of this country. And it made them proud. Swami Vivekananda made the Indians proud and gave them self-confidence because that was needed, you know, because for a very long time uh, we were uh, under foreign uh, aliens, uh, whatever garb, uh, they came and looted this country and finally we had the Britishers completely uh, suppressing human rights in this country and exploiting the natural resources. So at that particular time, uh, Swamiji's speech made a, a big contribution. And then we come to Sri Aurobindo in Bengal, who described India as Mother India, then Bankim Chandra Chatterjee, in his book, Ananvat, uh, and what the whole, uh, the original Vande Matram was there in the Ananvat store novel. So like this, it went on. But again, it's not sufficient to say that we got freedom only because of the names that I have taken. The youngsters of this country who were inspired by Aurobindo, Tilak, Bipin Chandrapal, and Lala Lachpatrai, and others, they took up the cause 
particularly Lala Lajpat Rai in Punjab, when the British uh, officer unnecessarily hit Lala Lajpat Rai on, the, on his head. And subsequently, when Lala Ji died, that was the time when, you know, Bhagat Singh got there and, uh, you know, he took up the issue and took revenge by killing that uh, British officer. But then Bhagat Singh is not alone. There were several like him throughout the country. Aluri, Sitaramaraju, and, you know, Barin Ghosh. So many people, uh, you know, and his friends, Rajguru, Chandrasekhar, Azad, and so many others. I would like, I wish to go on record saying that the youngsters of India had risen to the occasion. And uh, though in some of the books they are known as the terrorists, but simply they were, they love for the country and uh, they wanted to terrorize the Britishers to leave this country. They were terrorists for the Britishers, not for the Indians. A third dimension is Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose. His contribution is immense. You know, it's not a joke. Uh, uh, a person of his caliber going abroad, connecting to enemy's enemy. That is, our enemy was Britishers and their enemy was, you know, Germany and Russia so, and Japan. Marvelous work. And he not only that, he organized an army consisting of uh, prisoners of war captured during the Second World War by these, uh, by the enemies of uh, British. And uh, the, the, all the, an army was created, other in the house. And slowly there was, uh, dissent was brewing. Dissent was brewing in, in, in the British army also. The Indian soldiers, they already, you know, they were all, almost uh, ready to stage a mutiny. It was taking all these factors and the Second World War, uh, it, the Britishers realized that uh, their control over such a big country like India, particularly in the context of it, it having been sensitized, galvanized, motivated, and ultimately, you know, when the freedom struggle, thanks to Gandhiji, because he is the one who connected all the dots of India and made a wonderful garland of patriotism to be adorned by Mother India. So though Gandhiji's methods were peaceful, he, he, his message touched the soul of India. Everybody connected. And that's the reason when finally the Quit India movement was given, uh, you know, uh, India rose as one person and they were all united and they joined in that particular protest. That, that was a demonstration against the Britishers that we, the people of this area, we were all one and we wanted the Britishers to quit. Now coming to the, uh, normally 26 January means uh, we need to discuss about the constitution. And uh, here one sentence is very important. Preparation of the constitution. That is, we the people of India, we en envisioning a free India and figuring out what model of development we should be taking after independence. That occurred about 30 years before independence, approximately. With every Indian National Congress, that means whenever the Congress party was in session, and those days uh, they were mostly annual sessions, we can call that the people of this country were slowly progressing and graduating into uh, uh, what in the field of political development. And they were, uh, there is a consensus was emerging, for example, on fundamental rights, on directive principles, on federalism. Most of the uh, important uh, uh, phases of India's constitution can be described uh, to these uh, All India sessions. That is one, one part of it. Secondly, the Britishers also realizing the growing dissent in this country against them, they started slowly, though unwillingly, grudgingly, they started uh, giving some kind of a 
participation to the people of India. For, that is why we have those three very important acts. Government of India 1909, 1919 and 1935 acts. That is the Britishers had no choice but to, uh, you know, uh, enable the people in this country. And grudgingly, they enabled. Actually, we the people today, we need to know that even before independence, we had the political parties like the Muslim League, uh, the Hindu Mahasabha, and the Congress Party, even though uh, the Communist Party was there from 1925. So uh, it never really uh, developed roots in this country. And uh, so political parties were there, and uh, we the people in this country, we also had electoral experience because the elections were held uh, 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 before independence. And there were coalition governments established in some of the states of the provinces of uh, British India. Simultaneously, we need to realize that India had more than 550 or 570 princely states. And imagine a, a country, an area of the size of India, 500 and 500 uh, plus princely states and uh, uh, British India, you know, and a country without uh, hardly any education, but then people followed the leaders of the freedom struggle. They, people were, had their own expectations. And I salute the, the people of this country for having come together and liberated themselves. The Britishers did not hand over freedom just like that. The people of India fought for it. So many people underwent imprisonment. Made. Thousands of people were killed. Think of Jalian Bagh. Think of those freedom fighters who have been executed left and right. Think of Bhagat Singh and several of the youngsters who readily sacrificed their life at the altar of motherland. So it's not, uh, it's not that we got this freedom just by peaceful means. They were a multi, multi-dimensional, uh, several issues operated simultaneously, plus the Second World War. And, uh, you know, the unfolding of a new world order, all these things, uh, you know, compelled the Britishers and they had to leave, but they wanted to leave with some kind of a dignity. And they basically, they wanted a safe passage from India. Okay, now I come to the constitution. This constitution, the constitution of India, which was completed in 1949, November 26, became operative from January 26, 1950. Now, this constitution is the world's biggest document, constitutional document. And uh, <clears throat> naturally, it had to reflect the great diversity in this country. So that is uh, one aspect of it. Today, we are uh, celebrating, in a way, the 75th uh, anniversary of the uh, 75th Constitution Day. And uh, it's important for us to note that the Constitution itself is very lengthy and based on certain principles like parliamentary democracy, and, uh, you know, uh, federalism, secularism, sovereignty, I'll come to it when I deal with uh, uh, what we call the preamble. But it's very important to note that because of the past changing times as manifesting in India, the need of the hour, the conditions, the situations, you know, the Indian political system had to respond by amending the constitution. And this happened uh, 106 times. And this is very important for us to note that uh, Indian constitution is not uh, a rigid constitution. At the same time, it is not as flexible as the British. But it's important to note that it is uh, fairly rigid, but it can be amended to suit the needs of the hour. So in the, we, the people, have made tremendous progress, no doubt, when it comes to the political development. So the, there are ups and downs. Um, 
and I wish to focus on the preamble right now. So here, when we are talking about the preamble, it's important that we realize that this is a beautiful single sentence write-up. Uh, and uh, just it's so simple that I wish to uh, read out. The preamble is that we, the people of India, having solemnly resolved to constitute India into a sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic republic. And to secure to all its citizens, of course, that part I'll read later. So here, you know, because of the changing times, I sincerely appreciate uh, Dr. TSPR channel for uh, opening a debate on this. Let this debate continue in the days to come. And uh, as a senior political scientist uh, from Osman University, I wish to state that, and I wish to include, I propose to include the word sustainable, see, I read again, sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic, sustainable republic. The word sustainable, I am suggesting to be included in the preamble at this particular point. And I, I continue to read and to secure to all its citizens justice. So in the preamble, we have three factors, justice, social, economic, and political. But now the world is changing so fast. And uh, as everybody knows, the planet Earth is facing five major problems. One is the depletion of the ozone layer. Second is global warming, climate change. Third is the loss of uh, biodiversity. Fourth is expanding deserts. And the fifth is the danger posed by nuclear wars, nuclear bombs and reactors. Now in such a situation, and also because of the confusion, you know, governments throughout the world, they still have not properly understood what development is. And for most of the people, you know, what the government proposes or thinks or launches what they think is development, for the people, it normally appears to be destruction. That is why a large number of people throughout the world, particularly the poorest of the poor living in the margins of any state outside the city or in the low-lying areas, in the slums, what we call, uh, they, you know, they are, they are demanding environmental justice. That is, they are being pushed out of the regions. They are asked to vacate. They are simply thrown out. Their human rights are violated. They are not compensated properly. So this uh, rough attitude of the states, and this is happening everywhere, in China, in Russia, in America, irrespective of whatever political ideology those countries seem to or openly came to pro profess. So I am suggesting that justice economic Justice, social, economic, political, and environmental. Here, yeah, and environmental justice is now the demand of the world. And uh, this is very important. In America, we have uh, Robert Bullard, who is a great authority, is, a, is known as the father of environmental justice in the entire world. And it's speaking of people are demanding. So this demand of the people should be included. People should be allowed to include this. Okay, I, uh, because one very important point is that the entire preamble starts with we the people. We the we have made, we have given to ourselves. So uh, then we come to liberty, equality and fraternity. I'm not going into all the details, but it's the last line is very important. We the people, you know, the first three words and the last line, we adopt and enact and give to ourselves this constitution. Nobody has given this constitution to us. It is we the people. We have we adopt, enact, and give to ourselves this constitution. What is what does this mean? It signifies the power that is vested in the in, in the hands of the people. People are supreme. And here uh, with this, I close the preamble. But I wish to uh, focus on about five major issues.
because this is a wonderful occasion to promote uh, new ideas or inject uh, new ideas into the political system. First of all, as everybody knows, the Constitution of India focuses, it includes a chapter on the distribution of powers. Power in this country is distributed into the uh, in three categories, the central list, the state list, and the concurrent list. Okay? What I am suggesting is, as one working with the people on environmental issues and, you know, piling so many public interest litigations, I realize that they should, the, the distribution of power should be done into four, four lists. One, the central, second is the state list, third is the local government. The local government power should be uh, put, brought, uh, enlisted together, and certain corrections have to be taken. For example, as we already uh, through this channel we have earlier discussed that uh, entry. What is that entry, Anna? Entry five. Five one. Uh, entry five, which. Uh, which puts local government in the state list. Uh, that is a big joke. Having created local governments, having passed the 73rd Amendment, 74th Amendment, and uh, in, that, that only means that there is a constitutional assurance for the local bodies. And in spite of this assurance, uh, the, the mechanism to control, the, the weapon to control the local governments has been given to state government and state governments are suppressing them and that is the reason of real backwardness in this country because not a single village not a single gram panchayat or the municipality municipal corporation they don't have freedoms to organize to discuss to meet to organize and take decisions because the powers that have been transferred to them are very very meager and therefore this calls for a major revisit and reallocation and power should be genuine. It's time that the Constitution of India recognizes the concept of direct democracy and this has to be, uh, we can delve on this uh, when the time comes, but this is the need of the hour. Then we go a little further and in this, uh, I am foreseeing a major threat to India because what is happening is after this uh, election to the Lok Sabha, a delimitation committee, the process will start, delimitation of constituencies. And there is a lurking fear in a large number of states which have done their job of restricting population. They have uh, been uh, very good, very vocal. For example, Kerala, Tamil Nadu, no, almost the entire South India, you know they have and they have done a great work by restricting their individual uh, the the growth of the uh, human numbers. Only whereas major, in North India, only major community. Whereas, yeah, whereas in North India, whereas in North India, Bihar, uh, Eastern UP, and you know Bengal, uh, there's hardly they have not done any progress, and their numbers are increasing like anything. So it is feared that after the next delimitation, if the same process is continued, you know, that is the, the number of Lok Sabha seats are likely to increase rapidly. They, on one side, their seats will increase, and on the other side, the, the uh, states which have been very hardworking and which have done their job by restricting population, they are going to be punished. So this is a very serious issue. This I am only cautioning this on the 75th uh, uh, Constitution Day, uh, Republic Day, that, so that we can have deliberation, discussions, and India has to find solutions. In fact, the problem is so severe that I was in Karnataka and Tamil Nadu recently addressing meetings, and <clears throat> there is an underlying current of dissent, and uh, it, it, we don't know because Sometimes it may explode and it may hurt the very concept of federalism in a very, very big way. So that is why the government of India has to take 
the rising aspirations of the people uh, throughout the country and come up with solutions. Uh, you know, most Indian political parties, they are afraid of talking uh, these issues. They should be open and with an open mind, they should discuss the implications. So my suggestion is that they, it is time that we freeze the number of MPs from every state to the Lok Sabha. Let us freeze it once for all. Wonderful, wonderful. That is one. Secondly, when it comes to Rajya Sabha, there is no point, our Rajya Sabha is nothing but uh, 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 not to belittle it. Look at the composition. You find film stars, you find the corporates, you, you find people who can easily go to a to the uh, window of a political party and purchase the Rajya Sabha ticket. Detective what is this? Detective. Why can't we create equality of representation to states in the Rajya Sabha? You create equality of representation. At least, you know, we, people talk about federalism, but federalism basically means division of powers, right? Uh, between the center and the states, but it should be extended to the local government. But when it comes to Rajya Sabha, as the very name indicates, it's a council of states. And like the American Senate, let there be equal representation for every state, whether it is UP or Manipur. It has to be the same. Wonderful. Only then the states will feel comfortable. Yeah. So this is the second uh, point. As we go further, I strongly feel that this country requires strong institutions to ensure rule of law. We talk about rule of law, but then uh, you know how the present uh, model of development continues. Everybody is a psychophant, right from the vice chancellors to the collectors. They listen blindly to whatever comes from the chief minister or the prime minister's office. This is not the way. There is a rule of law. You create organizations and let them function as per the rule. Yeah. The, there is a much bigger responsibility for the chief ministers and the prime ministers. And they have to be constantly in session and trying to find solutions to the very many problems which should be springing from time to time. They have much greater role. Their approach should be of a statesmanship type and not interfere with the routine uh, administration. And the present model of IAS and IPS also, that is not suiting the people of this country. Recently, we had a very bad experience of an officer from Bihar uh, functioning as the chief secretary, not implementing, not even caring to implement Supreme Court orders. How many times should we go to the Supreme Court? And, wh and the, what about the common man? Can, he, can a common man go to the Supreme Court umpteen number of times? In the case of Patan Cheru, we got 40 orders, thanks to MC Mehta and several others in this. And yet those orders are not implemented because the Chief Minister plus the Chief Secretary together, they become a big obstacle. And they are not punished. What is the that is why judicial reforms also are very very important and uh, I I move further a little these are two more points and uh, then <clears throat> the first thing is in India we have large areas which requires guaranteed protection for example the Western Ghats and the Eastern Ghats or the Himalayas we have, we have a Himalayan crisis unfolding. And still we don't bother. We have not, we the people in this country, you know, what's, uh, what goes in the name of the government of India and the very many states and local governments in this country, we have never bothered to take climate uh, remediation. Climate is a very serious issue and we homo sapiens, we are at the cutting edge. Uh, we are about to be destroyed worldwide. All Why the scientific reports... We have five minutes more. All the science, yeah, all the scientific reports uh, they mention about this. And still, we we think we are not on this planet, and this is not the way. We are compromising on the needs of the people, particularly the young generation. 
Lastly, eternal vigilance is the price of, we need to pay. And uh, I blame the citizens also because they have become selfish, they have withdrawn. And even to cast a vote, they are demanding money. How many times it has been reported? That there are 6,000 rupees, 8,000 rupees, 10,000 rupees at the time of elections. And political parties to purchase those votes, they become even more corrupt. And this is hurting the welfare of this country. In every, you know, when we are talking about constitution, it's important that the people are aware of the natural resources balance sheet. We are a democracy. And um, one last suggestion when it comes to directive principles of state policy, I strongly recommend that all the sustainable development goals be included in the directive principles because that gives a direction for the whole country. And again, directive principles cannot continue to be just window dressing. Political parties have to come out openly, include all these things in their manifesto. And, uh, you know, uh, this is the time when I, when I call upon Indian political parties to green themselves. Otherwise, they'll become irrelevant. The youngsters of today are demanding sustainable development. The youngsters want uh, clean air, clean water, clean surroundings, and right to health, right to education, right to a universal uh, income. But then political parties are blissfully ignorant and therefore my appeal to the parties is that they should set up a research and development wing, R&D, in every political party. Thank you, boss. Wonderful, Anna, wonderful. Once again, this should be an eye-opener for all the political parties and the citizens alike because we have submitted this constitution to ourselves. Now, we should awake the reforms which Anna has suggested right from the preamble to what we need to be doing in the uh, <clears throat> division of powers to giving local bodies their share and then the sustainable part and the, the environment part are the major issues and then the universal income. For all this, every citizen should understand that they are the constitutional authority. Right from prime minister to chief minister, they are just public servants. And cabinet secretary to chief secretary, they are also public servants. So why do you fear them? That is why, as Anna said, right from panchayat, municipalities, then assemblies, then Lok Sabha, this should be from bottom to top. That is how decisions have to be made and policies should be made on the floor of assembly mm -hmm. or parliament. Otherwise, we are going to degenerate from people participatory constitutional democracy to towards autocracy as and when whatever they want and you have seen electoral bonds you don't know which party which corporate how much money they are giving and as a voter as a citizen we are not at all aware supreme court still sitting on that that is why he said judicial reforms are a must you have seen how election commission of election commissioners are being appointed by government that is also Supreme Court has to take a call. Judicial reforms have to come. So the all four wings, if they work in tandem, this constitution will be supreme, including the free press, as we are discussing with such great people, great minds like Professor K. Pushottam Redigaru, who are giving us a direct directive principle in the form of definite direction as to how we should be leading our country. Thank you very much once again. Wishing all the Indians the 75th Republic Day. Don't forget, we are the constitutional authority. Do support DRTSPR channels, Citizen DRTSPR channel, and Environment People DRTSPR channels. They are all in larger public interest only. Thank you very much.